Huh. You ever feel like you did, but nobody told you? I was really hoping on that Xbox showcase for at least some Gears news so that the time of releasing this video, there would be all types of hype around the Gears games again, not have the chance to replay this once again with updated graphics or something like that. But once again, we Gears fans were left with nothing after all the Starfield hype. Not to say I'm not excited about that game, but I was really hoping for some words about this game. Even if they said we'd have to wait another year or two, whether it's on Gear 6 or the Phoenix Collection, that would have been better than no words at all. But I guess we're stuck with what we have for now. It's not to say what we have now isn't great, being able to play Gears of War 3 with the 60 FPS boost is at least some upgrade. This epic finale we were given was supposed to be the last in a series. As far as we knew back then, before Microsoft got money hungry, after light mass bombing the Locust Stronghold and sinking the last standing stronghold for humans, or at least the COG, we arrived to Gears of War 3. Gears 3 released three years after Gears of War 2 release on September 20th, 2011, over a whole decade ago. Wow. There was also a beta released in April of the same year, and it just gave us a taste of what was to come. Little did we know how massive and successful this game was going to be. We've got so many new additions new modes, new customization, improvements in the overall gameplay, providing a better experience, amazing visuals for a game of its time, and an amazing story and conclusion to the trilogy. I don't think there's a single Gears fan out there today that even dislikes this game in the slightest. We get a lot about Marcus, of course. We learn more about Cole, Dom, Bear, and learn so much about the world of Sarah as a whole. There could have been more to get a little bit more out of these characters, but we can visit that towards the end of the video. If you try and ask Gears fans what they believe to be the better of the Gears games, from what I've seen at least, it's always been split between this and the second game. And while you expect the third game to be better in comparison, it's really hard to say truly which one is better than the other. I mean, for things like mechanics or gameplay, probably the third because of obvious leaps in technology and such. But past that, both stories are phenomenal. Both have great acting, storytelling, gore, music, characters, enemy types, and overall fun gameplay. Something Gears 3 doesn't have, however, is that dark tone the first game had and the second game had to a degree. That feeling of despair and depression was heavily felt in the first game and partially in the second, but this game is much more hopeful. That's not to say this game didn't have its dark or sad moments, but the overall tone of the game is centered on hope and a better future. I sometimes see people complain about the fact that this game didn't have the dark gritty nature that they loved in the first game, and that has been stripped away from each game, but I would argue that whether intentional or not, it fits with the overall story of the trilogy. The first game is the first time the COG banded as many people as they could together, ever, bringing a court-martialed convict to assist in finally taking the fight to the Locust, a threat that they had been getting rocked by for the past 14 years at that point. It was their first time truly fighting back. It was dark because the world at that time lacked hope. It lacked any foreseeable future because they were just desperate, trying anything they can to tilt the war in their favor for survival. Fast forward a few months, we're at Gears of War 2. The light mass didn't work, but now they plan to truly attack their home, find out where they live, and strike as hard as they can. Doesn't go exactly as planned, so they end up destroying their own for a second time around to try and finish off that threat. But as we know, that didn't work either. Now we're three years ahead, and they've been surviving against new threats they've never seen before since the locust got drowned, but they're still surviving, and are getting close to the eventual end of this generational conflict. So no, I don't think this or the last game should be super dark like the first. It simply wouldn't work. It wouldn't fit the theme of this game's narrative. And this is made all the more clear when you reach the end of the game, but that will of course have to wait because we have so much to talk about before we even get there. So like last time, let's first talk about the additions and changes that they've made. If you haven't already seen my first two videos on this series, go check them out before continuing. Or you can watch them out of order, I don't really care. It's up to you. Gears of War 2 certainly made some nice additions from the first game, but Gears of War 3 really stepped it up a notch. Again, we have more weapons, more executions, an updated horde mode, an entirely new game mode called Beast Mode, so many more maps, an arcade mode for the campaign, and then so much more. There were four new weapons this time around, which are the Retro Lancer, the Sawed Off Shotgun, the One Shot, and the Digger. That's with a D. The Retro Lancer is an older model of the Lancer we know and love now that only has a blade of a bayonet on the front instead of a chainsaw. It shoots much slower for more damage, but it has a recoil strong enough to break your damn shoulder. And you can also charge forward with it as well. Man, I don't know if any of you guys are around for the beta or the early days uh, playing multiplayer, but I was. And I swear in every game in the beta, they were just charging each other with the Retro Lancers. It was a great time. The Sawed Off Shotgun is just that. It has a very short range with high damage output, but only one shot and a very long ass reload. The one shot does exactly what you think. Take aim first as it needs a couple of seconds to wind up the shot and then it shoots like a sniper. And as the name suggests, it'll kill whatever you hit in one shot. The digger with a D shoots a small creature with a grenade attached to it that when it shoots underground, it'll go all the way until it's next to somebody, jump out of the ground and explode in their face. Also got some updates to some weapons. The Gorgon pistol now shoots fully automatic instead of a burst and the hammer burst now has iron sights. So 
that's cool, I guess. Hard mode now works a bit differently. The core is still the same, 50 waves of enemies, with every 10th wave being a boss wave, but now there's fortifications. Before, people would just wait until round 10 and then get demolished shields and then use that as cover. So I guess Epic saw that idea that everybody used and just gave us these fortifications. How it works is you start on any given map you choose to play on, and each map there are multiple areas where you can set up at that are called command posts. Once you pick a post, you can start putting down equipment like barriers, decoys, turrets, and such as that, and each of these can be upgraded over time. And not to forget, all of these things have a currency tied to them that you earn just from completing these waves. This was such a massive leap from two to three, and I think just about everybody enjoyed it. Most of my hours from this game come from Horde alone. I mean, I did unlock Aaron Griffin the third. if that says anything for the people who know. For those that don't know, you unlock Aaron Griffin, the cameo from the middle of the story, by completing a challenge for a medal, which that challenge is to earn five million dollars in total over the course of playing Horde mode. I don't know if anyone's done the math for that or how long it takes to get through all those games, but it takes a long time. There was also the addition of beast mode, the opposite of horde mode, where instead of playing as the cog, you got to play as the locust. And not just your casual grenadier, nah, you get to play with all locust variants, from tickers all the way to even berserkers. The difference now is that you have the time limit to kill the cog, but it only lasts for 12 rounds. That being said, it's a really difficult game mode, but it's also extremely fun, and it's probably the saddest fucking thing that they have yet to bring this back in Gears 4 or 5, but that's the coalition for you. There's also arcade mode for campaign, and technically horde as well. After completing the story at least once the game lets you add mutators which alter the game in various ways. There's five easy ones, five hard ones, and five fun ones. Easy ones are like being able to kill with one melee hit no matter the difficulty you're on, or turning into a comet when you run burning anything in your path. The hard ones are things like no health regen, or you have to perfect reload every time you want to reload. It makes replaying the campaign in horde mode so much more engaging and fun. And while we're on the campaign, the story mode also now allows up to four people to play rather than just two with the past games. This is really awesome, especially with my friend group and I I assume many other people's friend groups you have more than probably just two friends you want at least like three or four people to play with this game and now you actually can sucks that we can't get that same treatment anymore nowadays though there's also two new mechanics where if you die and down but not out or get taken hostage and if you have a grenade in your hand you can drop it upon dying the other grenade mechanic is if you have someone as a hostage you can click to your grenade and you can stick it on them and kick them forward okay so I know I typically just talk about the story and the game's updates but for gears I need to talk about its cosmetics and how its multiplayer worked as well It'll be more important once we get to Judgment 4 and 5, and I'm sure if you've played those games, you know exactly why I gotta talk about this. But for those same reasons, I think it's important to talk about how great the progression system and cosmetics were in this game. In the second game, you had 10 COG and 12 Locust characters that you could unlock by just playing through the game's story as well as the first game's story. But for this game, we've got 35 COG and 24 Locust. That's triple the COG and double the Locust. But there are more complex challenges to unlock some of these characters as well. There are the usuals like level up to a certain point and complete the campaign. There's also the ones of completing the first and second game's campaign, like the second game did. But then we have challenges like complete beast mode on all four difficulties, which I still have not finished to this day because it's extremely hard and I don't have any other friends to complete this with because they haven't played this game in years. And if you couldn't tell, I'm a little salty about it because he's the only guy I don't have and it's bothering me. And there's also the Griffin challenge. You have to earn a certain amount of money in horde mode, like I said earlier. Another insane challenge to unlock a character was for the character Chairman Prescott. You you had to unlock the All Father Medal. To shorten it, you had to play 300 games of each versus game mode, and there were six game modes in total. I think the Golden Hunter and Golden Miner also needed roughly 2,000 kills with certain weapons to unlock them. And as for the Cantus, you needed to revive 600 players in order to unlock him. So yeah, there were some difficult challenges to unlock some of the characters in this game. There's also DLC characters or other event characters like Barrick and the Mexicans for Dom and Baird. But there's many challenges like these that not only made it more fun to play the game, but it also gives a lot more to do in the game that they enjoy. Something that a lot of these newer games today are missing, including these later games in the series. Same things go for the weapon skins as well. I think in the second game, it was only a gold hammer burst and lancer that you could get. I think the lancer was exclusive to the limited editions of the game, and I think people got the hammer burst through getting the midnight release copies. Man, remember when that used to be a thing? But for this game, much like the playable characters, you could earn many skins through challenges as well. Some were also purchasable, and some were achievable in the beta of the game, like the gold skin for the retro and the sawed off, which I had the gold retro skin and the beta, but it just disappeared when I actually got the game and I never got that skin back. I'm still salty about that to this day too. But you all see my point. Gears 3 had a lot in store for its players. A great multiplayer with many modes, supportive DLC, an upgraded board mode, an entire new mode called Beast, and a lengthy story mode with an arcade mode for it. We're first given a recap video. The COG doesn't exist as a name anymore and Chairman Prescott has abandoned everybody. She basically gives a recap of the first two games and then catches us up on what's happened so far. After sinking Jacinto, they move to an 
an island, and after a matter of months, Lambents start attacking. Some of them got on ships to stay on the water, and some of them have gone back to the mainland to hold out. So not everybody is stranded. We're back at the cell where Marcus was being held in prison, but things are different this time. There's a different creature up here, and Anya, instead of Dom, is breaking him out. It then becomes clear that this is a dream. Anya says Marcus's dad is alive and needs him, but as far as we know, he's dead. The world crumbles and we're at his dad's house now. He's trying to save his research and Marcus is trying to save him. At first it seems like a flashback, but for some reason both Anthony and Ben Carmine are here, so I guess it's still a dream. He first starts by saying his dad cared mostly about his research and that he disobeyed orders to try and help him for it. As we all know, it cost them the battle and he ended up getting court-martialed and with a life sentence for it, and yet he still couldn't get his dad. He wakes up in another bed, indicating that it was in fact a dream dream and we find ourselves aboard a ship. It's been two years since the sinking of Jacinto. The intercom rings and him, Dom, and Jace are being called upon so we go and collect them. We first get Dom who's tending to his lovely tomatoes and he's got a new look if you didn't catch it in the opening. Intercom rings again and they announce a raven is inbound even though Cole, Baird, and Sam and Carmine just left to gather some supplies as they mentioned earlier. Only Dom, Baird, and Marcus have rooms down here. Don't know where Cole's room is. Either this is racism or bro has a penthouse on a ship. Walk upstairs and you see what's called lambent stalks out side that are empty. Retrieve Jace, who's struggling to get a box of mint candy, gross by the way, out of this vending machine. He gives up and if you go for it, you can kick it yourself. I'm confused why he didn't just break this thing open. It's not like he's gonna get fined for stealing or anything. Well, I guess he is black. There's a few of these thrash ball tables you can find in different parts of the game and they all have a cool cold woo voice when you press it. Captain Michelson, the guy on the intercom, says that they've entered Lambent waters now. Although it's been three months since they last seen Lambent, you find Anya and she's wearing the same as she was in the intro, a Gears armor. There isn't command anymore it's just survival, so now she's also had to take up some weapons. Although I'm willing to bet she probably had training before the war even started, she just hasn't had to actually use it. She lets you all know that the raven you heard about approaching is actually Prescott returning after all this time. You leave to go see him, and Nash here, that's his name by the way, gets popped by some spider lambents, which are apparently called polyps. And like all lambent we've seen before, they explode, and so will all lambent going forward. Make it upstairs, and there's another variant that they haven't seen before called dredges. The other variants you see must just be some drones that they're used to by now. This means that the Lambent is still mutating these newer variants. Bring the lift up and Prescott lands with his onyx guards. He says he needs to speak with whoever's in charge and leaves to speak with them while giving Marcus a disc on his way. They get attacked by the Lambent again, clear them out, and head for the CIC. Once there, they play Prescott's disc and a video of Adam Phoenix plays and he's asking for Marcus's help. He's currently being held by the Locust to try and fix the Lambent problem and stop the humans, but the video gets cut off. It comes back on and he says that the Lambent came from emulsion and that it's killing the planet currently. He's been trying to contact Marcus, but then the video cuts and they get attacked again. And apparently Prescott is cornered and Michelson is injured. Get down and fight through them and then you get to use the best weapon in the game, the fucking fire extinguisher. Get to Michelson's and, you know, he's dead. Marcus commands Prescott to stay put this time as they go and get rid of the Lambent so helicopters can take off. Man, I sure hope he listens this time and doesn't get hurt or anything. You know, that would be awful. He just got here. Get through some Lambent. I like that the small detail of taking cover at the table and flipping it, I just think that this is cool. Even though a bullet going through would still hit your ass, but it looks pretty cool, I guess. Hit a lever to raise the lift for the first chopper and move to the second one. But before you get the chance, a tentacle from a leviathan that's releasing a bunch of polyps destroys it, meaning that this has to be a lambent leviathan, showing that the emulsion has spread pretty far. Clear the lambent out here and they get on the lift to go stop the leviathan, but first there's fires everywhere so you gotta clear them out. After clearing three of those, the leviathan again attacks, ripping the ship up and you all fall down beneath and don't die. Look, it's the third game, we've all seen the coincidences and the luck these gears have had with the diamond suit of plot armor that they all have at this point, so instead of speaking about their luck each time something happens, I'm just going to add a counter each time at the top here. They recover and Cole talks to us for the first time and says he can't see the Leviathan from where they are and that they need to blow his brains out his ass. He later says to try and lure it to the front of the ship. They then grab two silverbacks, these halfway diva mechs that have some Gatling gun turrets on each arm and you can press A to stand still and switch to only using rockets. You can also kick and stop when enemies are near. Don't try it with things that explode though, like this. These mechs also have a health bar and when depleted the mech will explode but you do have some time to hop out when the explosion starts. So you need to fend off the Leviathan here just by shooting them in the eye long enough for Cole and Bear to do what they need to do. They wait, and then Delta 2 drops tickers from the bridge above, killing the Leviathan. Excellent plan, really. Uh, blow up just about everything, and now they need to jump ship to escape Baird's death from above, and we fade to black, and then we go back an hour. Now we get to see Delta 2's side, which includes Baird, Cole, and two new additions. Sam, the Australian foil for Baird, and Carmine. The third one, Clayton. He's just a tad beefier than his brothers. Unlike his brothers, Clayton is the first character in a Gear series to 
have his fate be left up to the players. Although this would not be the last time we will come to find out in Gears 5, but that's a different story for another time. The decision was given to players to purchase a cert for your Xbox avatars. They either said save Carmine or Carmine must die. And a majority side of shirts purchased decided his fate and all the proceeds of those shirts went to Child's Play Charity. The decision I think we can wait till the end to see his fate, but you'll see that there are a few times in this game where they play with his fate, most times mainly in this chapter. So Delta 2 is here looking for supplies and they're in the city of Hanover, Cole's hometown. I asked for a little more out of the characters in the last game and now we're actually getting some and I love it. They come across a destroyed stranded outpost and then an active one next over. They approach and they ask for some food, but these guys also hate the cog here. He offers some bacon in exchange for Sam, but unfortunately we get no bacon. He directs us to the stadium where they have more supplies. So Baird here says Jack needs a power supply for him to work again. He just doesn't have one yet, but Jack is on the ship right now as we saw in his room at the beginning. Just remember that for now since the ship blows up. Fight through some glowies for the first time on land and they spawn differently than locusts do. A set of emergence holes that you can throw a nade inside of to stop them from spawning, there's now stalks like we saw earlier for the Lambent. And on these stalks, there's these pods of Lambent where they spawn out of and they will continue to spawn until either a lot have spawned or you shoot those pods and burst them on a certain stalk. Afterwards, the stalk will turn brown and they will stop spawning. I have a love-hate relationship with the Lambent in this game. Love because they do a lot to switch up how combat flows in this game, like having to find the right angle to shoot the pods or the dredges mutating sometimes, which we'll get to in a second, or the simple fact that every enemy explodes on death, making it lethal to be next to any of them when you kill them. The dredges I was talking about have three possible mutations upon taking enough damage. One where it grows two arms that shoot lethal emulsion at you that kind of ignores your cover if they have a height advantage over you, and another mutation that grows a long neck and starts spewing emulsion at you. If you destroy the body and not its head, the head snake, as they call it, will still be alive and crawl towards you during the same until killed. Oh, they also try to kamikaze you upon death as well, so watch out for that. Continue through the city, and Carmine almost dies for the first time by flying car. Carmine, look out! Whoa! That was close fight through more glowies and we get this scene with Cole where he sees a cardboard cut out of himself from his earlier days of thrash ball. A more peaceful time. That life, or rather that person he once was, can't be again due to the ever-growing conflict of the Locust and Lambent. Cole's been the most enthusiastic motherfucker since day one, but with this conflict going on, this shows that even under that, he too feels the weight of survival and war on him. Move through the grocery store, killing more glowies, and come across an old hat you can choose to wear forwards or backwards, and another one of the interactions you can hear Cole voice lines. And you press it enough and you get his line in Gears 2 on the intercom where he's yelling at the queen. I like small interactions like this. They're not really necessary for the gameplay, of course, but they're just fun to have. Like this fire alarm you can pull. Just small additions like that add to the quality that we are really missing in a lot of newer games nowadays. Come across a loader designed the same way as a silverback. It just doesn't have guns and used for loading, you know. Find some food supplies in the next room, take them, and then get rid of some lambin outside to allow the chopper to take the food. This random box of food was just sitting here, so I wonder if it's anyone else's and we just stole their shit but I guess that doesn't matter. Keep moving forward and Lambin are overrunning the area and Cole says that they should just keep looking for food and supplies, especially at the stadium, just to be thorough. Sure. Come up to a new variant, this huge blob called a Gunker. They say and call it a Gunker as if they've seen one before, the but they haven't seen dredges before. Just gonna assume it was like an AI spotting an enemy so they'll say the name out loud. Regardless, Gunkers are these Lambent giants that lug emulsion bombs at you that have an explosion when they land, causing you to leave cover to avoid it. While they throw emulsion with one arm, the other arm is used for attacking directly. If you're close enough, it'll try and stab you with this extremely far-reaching blade arm. This blade arm also just defies logic, but these guys don't have any mutations. They just have a big explosion when they die. Clear them out and get to the warehouse with more stranded, with Baird still being classist and having a disdain for them, while Cold tries to reassure them that they're all just humans trying to survive as well. Carmine nearly dies to a sniper, of all things, and he says sorry afterwards because he thought that they were lambent. Nah, but I'm sorry. This man's like 10 feet away from these people. How did he not see them? First of all, how did the cog not see that this dude was trying to take a shot? And how the fuck did this dude not realize that these guys are wearing giant ass shiny blue armor that just took out all the Lambent in front of his door? I think he was just trigger happy. He wanted to shoot somebody, man. A woman appears and she agrees to get you guys some supplies, but the boss may not be happy to see them. Lots of people recognize Cole and welcome him home. Baird gets really sick of seeing poor people. Cole also gets some bitches, but her head malfunctions. Coltrane. Hi, Coltrane. So, where'd you get a hold of it?
and eventually she leads you to a stockpile of ammo. The chopper coming for the ammo lets you know someone's been shooting from the bridge that's up ahead. Clear some Lambda down all the way to the stadium. Baird says he blow up a bridge just to be sure that Stranded stopped shooting and Sam replies that's why he never gets promoted. They get to a locked gate and Carmine stupidly asks for wire cutters. Then they fend off a couple of gunkers that somehow don't destroy this bridge upon death. Come up to more Stranded and a perspective goes first person I think for the first time in a Gears game ever and Cole talks to the Stranded about seeing the boss to help out against the Lambent. I love this scene. They're really doing a lot to characterize Cole a lot more given that he's just been the more comedic relief character recently. I like that we're seeing some more background about him. This is really great. They get attacked. You choose a path to go through and help and eventually make it to a locker room. Baird makes a joke but they all leave and give Cole some space as he gets to his locker. He grabs his helmet that's somehow still here and starts fantasizing about the old days. He somewhat comes back to reality and helps planting a bomb on some stocks but does it as if he was in a game again. I was playing with my girlfriend here and I thought it was funny that they kept this in two player view but it's it's just Cole but I'm not really going to question it. It just looks kind of funny when they could have just put it in single player mode. This is a nice fun scene but it's also pretty sad knowing that he can never have this again and that this is probably the closest he'll get to having this experience again. The ship calls and they're getting attacked by Lambent. Then they try asking the woman in charge for transportation back to the ship since helicopters can't come and get them. And she says no in a very friendly way. Then they decide to go to the bridge instead and drop down to the ship from above, but they need to get to a cable car. Go up these elevators and make it to those cables. There's no car here, so they start writing down the cables with these hooks and Cole loses his hat, but he's not Indiana Jones, so I guess that shit's just gone. I wish we could keep the hat. Make it to the bridge and there's a shit ton of Lambent waiting for you, just in case you thought you were safe behind cover. You're not if a gunker is there, since the big knife that I talked about goes to fucking everything. I don't know why or how, just don't get close essentially. Get up to the quote unquote stranded and they start shooting at you all and turns out they're actually just locusts. I don't know how the stranded have been living like a thrash ball fields distance away from these guys and just assume that they're also stranded. Like I get staying away if they just shoot on sight, but no one ever saw locusts the entire time. But I guess I would also stay away from motherfuckers shooting at me too. Clear them out of their barricades, find out that they're using retro lancers for turrets and have just been here trying to survive like everybody else scraping by. Start making your way through the locusts here and they've set up a lot here with some tickers, defensive walls, and some turrets. These can't all be for humans if they've been stranded and avoiding the area entirely, so they must be trying to hold their own against Lambent as well since the flooding. Fight through some more. Sam apparently has a crush on Dom and get to where we heard Cole when we were playing as Marcus. So Baird answers my question. They have seen a Lambent Leviathan before. Apparently he killed one smaller than this one before. Like we heard earlier, playing as Marcus, they decide to drop tickers on them. Get across the bridge, get rid of a mortar crew, get rid of some gas barges with said mortars, get rid of some polyps, and then some more locusts, and then finally drop the tickers. They said earlier the mortars would just piss the Leviathan off, yet they drop like 20 tickers max on him. That can't be enough explosive power than the mortars, right? Leviathan destroys a sip and a bridge along with it, and they all fall while Baird professes his fake love for Sam. Alright, seems like everybody survive. They recover and see a locust group moving on their position, so they gotta move. Come across what are wild tickers. No bombs, they just eat weapons and run away. I don't think they ever attack you either. Now you're fighting some locusts who shoot themselves up out of the ground to spawn now. Don't know how that works. I don't know if they have rocket boots on or they just hulk jump out the ground. Anyways, you push on to see the wreckage Baird caused and find Marcus and Dom washed up. They recover and Anya calls asking for help saying Prescott is wounded and there's more injured. Delta 2 gets caught up for like two seconds and then a new enemy appears using the digger with the D that we talked about before. They're just boomers with these weapons but they're also dressed in the same stuff these other outcast locusts are wearing. Move up and come across what's a siege beast, big ass bug thing that just launches this fiery gas bag. Use it to destroy two others and a broomock and you're on your way. Small complaint, it forces your camera to follow the ball after shooting it like this, which is cool for like the first three times that you do it, but after using it throughout the game, it gets repetitive and I wish you could just skip the animation, but you can't. You actually have to sit there and watch it. Make it to them and this man Prescott is fucked. He came back and all he had to do was stay alive for like an hour. Marcus wastes no time at all, not that he really has any, and asks where his dad is at. Adam has been at Azura, a research facility since the Queen captured the place days ago. Marcus yells at the dying man, where is this place? And he gives an encryption for the disc he gave us and says that an old bastard would be furious and he dies. The bastard in question is Hoffman, who has a disc that's been encrypted since he stole it from Prescott years ago. And Baird says that this encryption is probably the key to that disc that most likely holds the location of Azura. Hoffman is at Anvil Gate, so they need to reach him for this disc. Locusts interrupt, right on schedule. Clear your 30th wave of horde and they're able to open 
Adam's video. The video is short as he was only able to recover a little bit. And it's just Adam saying that Prescott abducted him and took him to Azura and that he's trapped there. This is all pretty fucking insane to figure out. I guess Prescott is dead, but still this man thought all these years he failed to save his dad and landed in prison with a life sentence just for him to actually be alive because Prescott stole the man's father. Sam says she can guide them across the Deadlands to get to Anvil Gate, but she's ordered to stay with Carmine, Anya, and Jace to watch over the salvage of the ship until things are better than they can catch back up. They decide to follow the barges to eventually steal one to get to Anvil. Bear takes something that's probably a navigation system from the barge that they shot down earlier. You come up to some warning signs of dead people in cages and they ignore it as usual and then enter as a corpser. Not like the big ones you normally see but a small one. They burrow under the ground and chase sometimes stabbing with one of their legs until they pop out to which then you can shoot either their face or their ass to kill them. It'll just go back on the ground and you repeat that process until it dies. Fight some more locusts on the way. Another locust comes out, sounds a horn, and more start attacking and some of these dudes have Theron armor but they're using butcher cleavers. Something you've never really seen a Theron, supposedly higher up amongst locusts, really do before. Them having to resort to using cleavers and seeing these retro lancers that they've all set up and conjured up around here, you can tell that they've been struggling very hard since the flood. And it doesn't seem like they have any direction either. Something that you're going to continue to see and witness as you progress through these areas until mid to late game. Push forward and pass the siege beast, take and use it against them, then keep moving forward. The group comes up to where they can see most of the locusts areas and they've seen that they really dug the fuck in here and must have been doing this since the flood. They see where the barges are and start heading in that direction. The next part can go two different ways. The objective is just to move forward through this place but they don't know that you guys are here yet. You can either sneak through this area getting rid of the lookouts at the top of these sections here or if you get caught and just want to add to Marcus's already extremely high kill count you can just go through guns blazing. Decide to sneak through then there's just a side door that opens with significantly less locusts to deal with rather than the murder route which then adds a mortar crew boomers and some corpsers to fight walk in and there's some tickers held captive pass through here pass and shoot some more locusts here and you're on your way and now as it appears that we're getting closer to these barges you eventually get spotted and have to run between some trenches to escape mortar fire once out you see a tower that is essentially the pit stop for all these barges and Baird says he's already got the navigation tool mapped and ready to go to anvil gate really wish I knew how the hell he had time to figure out locust tech and then map it between gunfights but he is extremely smart and I can't really put it past him to be tinkering with shit in the middle of a gunfight so I guess it checks out. Fight some savage locusts here, move back on the ground to avoid getting blasted on a surface by more artillery. Once inside, you see some more tickers in cages, fight again and eventually get to a ticker assembly line and damn, these little dudes just sit up here strapped upside down and just to have a bomb attached to them to go and die. Pretty much all the locust monsters and how they use them is pretty awful and sad as we've already come to find out. Long fight through here while getting to use these tickers to your advantage but you also still need to be aware of the ones that are still coming up. Get past them, walk into a den up ahead and get trapped by some locusts. A corpser attacks and eventually so do some butchers and drones to try and finish you off. Doesn't work but eventually get to some corpser babies and you know that the mom is probably on the way. The mom yells and the eggs start hatching. They clearly don't have armor on so they're pretty easy to kill. Although it'd be funny as hell if they just spawned with armor. The mom attacks and same as the first game you shoot it in the eyes except it doesn't just back up now like before it'll just move around but still do around the same attacks as usual. The young corpsers start attacking as well also without armor on just a bunch of creepy spongy ashy spiders running around to kill until the mom is ready to fight with decreasing eyesight. Eventually blind her and she'll start screaming and destroying the place and begins to cause the place to collapse. Escape and they all die from the tectonic plates shifting just because the mom couldn't see. This fight isn't too difficult but I am glad that they give checkpoints mid-battle much like a boss fight towards the end that definitely helps but we'll get there. I also got to say that the corpser without its eyes is like nightmare fuel for me back then and it still sort of is because what the fuck. Once out you see many barges for taking and then mirror appears out of nowhere with a couple of reavers and their own queen bug, which I don't know if they ever say, but the bug is named Tempest. She notices Marcus is the one causing all of this and on track to Azura, so she commands everyone to start preparing defenses from here to Azura. She's seen with some locusts that don't appear to have the same savage outfits as all these other locusts do around here, which is very interesting to keep in mind as well. There's also a new enemy type here. I believe they're called Shriekers, basically flying and shooting tickers that roll out in numbers. Another enemy type that says, fuck your cover, and if they get close, they can just fly past your cover or above you, and if you kill them too close, see they'll fall down towards you and explode they do that regardless but if you're close then you know you'll blow up 
fight through and finally make it to the tower for these gas bags. This barge will circle around at least five times, dropping two Therons on opposite sides of you, each time all while launching artillery at you. There's only a few pieces of cover here, and most of them break, so you'll need to kill guards as soon as they drop before more drop on the other side while running from cover to cover differently each time to avoid the artillery coming in. And after taking the ones that drop down, you got a few more on the bars, then you can finally hijack it. So now that you're aboard this hijacked barge, you're about halfway to Anvil and you see some fight happening off in a distant small town. Someone comes on a radio asking for help as if they're pinned down by some barges and it's none other than the fucking goat, Dizzy. So like all Gears of War fans around this time, you were also heavily anticipating his arrival since we never knew his fate from the Scourge fight from last game. Although I'm assuming somewhere in the books, it'll probably mention that he did survive, but here was a nice shocker. He was here to try and get some supplies for Anvil, but then he got caught lacking. Help him out here by getting rid of some of the initial barges and then the locust down there as well. Clear them out and start helping him move some ammo for him as they explain what they're coming for. Confirming Hoffman is still trying to access the data on the disc. Grab anything in here that you like and then you all get attacked again by some reavers and such. Clear them out and make it back towards the barge. Back on a barge now, you've got a lot of barges on your side to get rid of as well as reavers. It's really cool how they did this sort of pseudo train track and how the day turns to night pretty smoothly. It's just a nice cool transition here. Get closer and you can't contact Anvil but soon the queen starts attacking the barge and starts shooting a beam of light so strong it'll cause you and anything in sight to catch fire from the bug's mouth. She burns your barge and you all crash and you all land moderately safely and Hoffman shows up to pick you all up. He drives you all back and Marcus tells him all about the disc and what's happened so far and Hoffman develops aphasia after hearing everything and now it's the time to defend the front gate. The locust that was just previously attacking you are now right outside by the queen's orders. Run to the front and hold the wall as long as you can. Do move around though otherwise reavers are going to hit you. They won't just let you sit there and wait like I tried. You got a turret here and some other weapons here around here to defend. Get rid of some reavers, boomers, hookers, and eventually some siege beasts will come and destroy the front, causing you all to push back and defend the second gate. Baird asks Hoffman if they can use the Hammer of Dawn, but it's bigger and the targeting data is off, so therefore it's dangerous. Hold them as long as you can. I don't know if this is all dependent on time or a certain amount of locusts that you kill, but get rid of some more hookers, blood mounts, and boomers. Then at some point, even after dropping bombs on them, maulers will break their way through, and now you all have to fall back once again. Repeat the same at the new location to defend. They'll break through the next and at the last gate of the garage. Then after like 20 boomers, they use the last resort thanks to Bernie. Speaking of Bernie, I didn't know who she was until I searched her a bit ago since she's more in the books and just appears here. She's pretty badass and I wish we got more of her. Marcus has his second big talk of the day and tells Hoffman the rest of what happened and he's less mad at Prescott than I would have been. Baird says he can work on the hammer satellites and Bernie comes back in saying Anya and Sam are right outside but they're under attack. Baird tells Bernie to make sure Hoffman watches his blood pressure and stays calm for the most part. Don't know if he has a condition or he's just being coy. They decide to split up, some going out in the trucks to go retrieve them and some staying behind at the wall to provide covering fire. Staying at the wall is a little boring, so we go out in the truck. Anya says Carmine and Jace are behind for now and they'll catch up later. Okay, so at this section, you know you drive up and a digger with a D hits the truck and topples you all. But for some reason, I think I took damage here from the digger with a D and died right at the scene. I also was taking damage before, which I guess is okay. I'm just confused as to why when I can't take cover, it makes you stand so I just get shot. But dying to the digger with a D is what really just didn't make any sense. I've died on this part many times, so yeah, this is the only time that that's actually happened, so that was weird. But anyways, upon surviving the crash, some gear unfortunately named Jinx is getting BM'd over here, showcasing this new execution that they added in for Gears 3, and now it's time for everybody to fall back to the fort. Side note, that's mad disrespectful in the middle of a big-ass firefight to take your time to rip off a man's arm and smack his fucking face with it. I'd be pretty upset for like the last 10 seconds that I live for. You start pushing back and you have a lot of locusts and then Lambent start entering the fight as well. Get past some locusts, some more Lambent. Marcus tells Bear to start using the hammer while they're coming back and about halfway there a Lambent freaking berserker hops out of a pod and ends these two, flips a car at you, and Hulk leaps in the air towards you all. Everybody's pants are filled with shit and it's time to start running now. I was so damn hyped when I saw this shit. You didn't see a single berserker in Gears 2 so I just assumed that they were gone, like the krill or some shit, but now they're back with just some cool yellow paint. Get away and head for the gate as the hammer starts up. Get to the gate Get inside, gates closed, hammers going off, and the screaming stops. They, for some reason, think that she died, and she Hulk leaps again over the gate, and now we got a boss. So the objective will be obvious here, but Professor Baird outlines it for us anyway. Like regular Zerkers, it's invulnerable to all damage, but this one, since becoming Lambent, its ribs and heart are now exposed. So as it charges at you, its chest will open, and you gotta shoot its heart. Repeat this a few times, and it eventually starts leaking emulsion on the ground. They also start jumping at you, unlike regular Berserkers, but they're pretty telegraphed, so there's nothing really difficult here. A few more times, the jumps get bigger, as do the emulsion fumes.
items that it tracks behind it, and then it eventually explodes, and no one takes damage. They finally get some time to look at the data on the disc and see a 3D depiction of Azura. It's an island covered by what's called a maelstrom barrier, just a giant artificial hurricane covering the entire island to hide it. They realize the only way to get there is by going under. Hoffman says there's a sub over yonder, and Dizzy says he can take care of any repairs and fuel it if he needs to. Dom knows a couple of places to get fuel that's on the way, and the first one we're going to is Maria's hometown, Mercy. Marcus asks if Hoffman and Bernie will come along, but he says he's going to stay and defend here, as he has since the Pendulum Wars. Marcus asks Baird and Cole to go and find some reinforcements while they go get fueled up. We actually do get to see this little adventure that these two go on, but we won't be able to see that until Judgment, so that'll have to wait for now. And trust me, we are definitely doing a video on Judgment. Now you're all the driving on the way there, and this section is extremely fun and very well done. Just using a Vulcan the entire ride, getting rid of anything in a way, which includes old rusted emulsion pipelines, corpses, and any other locusts that were unlucky enough to be stationed out here in the desert. Locusts set up a trap to get you all stuck in the sand, you shoot your way out and get back on the road. Brumok appears ahead and they drag the razor wire and cut the Brumok's head clean off. Damn. Finally make it to Mercy and it's completely empty, though Dizzy says people were here just months ago. The main pump is down, so they follow the line to figure out what happened, while Jace and Dizzy stay behind. So now you're all walking around this abandoned town searching for what happened. Dom says he hasn't been here in the past 15 years and that he wanted to bury his family here, but stops talking and everyone just stays silent and keeps moving. Dom is a strong dude, because I feel like many other people, myself included, would probably break down being here. And just thinking about the very fact that you couldn't even get your family here to bury them in the first place is just so saddening. Walk up further and you can finally see the pipeline, but you also see a proximity charge on it. Disable it, or don't, and it'll turn off and you guys keep moving. Disable two other charges and then nearly die by this guy. He says he's trying to plant them to stop what's going on around here. He says people have been having bad fevers and tearing up other people. They try helping him, but he runs away and says it's too late. Follow him and a pipe starts to lead underground. Get down there and bro has already died. We didn't hear him scream at all, but he really got fucked up. But now the question is, what the hell killed him? Keep walking forward and you can hear these really ominous sounds. Get closer and you see somebody hunched over and Marcus walks up to help and they turn around and they are in fact Lambent. So now we know that the Lambent doesn't just affect locusts, but also humans as well, causing them to turn into these zombies. They attack in numbers, but just smack and die fairly quickly. Call Dizzy and Marcus thinks that they should stop them from spreading while also getting to the fuel. But now everybody sees why that dude is about to blow this place up. Get to a courtyard and defend here against more infected, because we don't say zombies here. After clearing them out, the guy above lets you all up. They ask if he's all right, but there's another dude just suffering over on this bed over here. He starts explaining how it starts, and not even two seconds in, he gets attacked and dies immediately. You get through a few waves of the infected, although they're really just called former humans. At least that's what Sam calls them. They mention that locusts will show up soon to attack, so they need to hurry. Go towards the fuel pump, and while you all head there, Dom goes to visit a statue, or grave, I believe, and speaks to Maria, saying he needs to help Marcus now to save the world, and leaves his dog tags behind. Never really a good sign. Marcus is working on the pump, and Dom comes by and just hands him his knife, but doesn't ask for it back. He gets the pump going, and more former infected zombies humans start attacking again. Clear them out and head underground through an old raid shelter used during the Pendulum Wars to make their way back to the trucks. Dizzy says that the tanker can't take any fuel since there's too many leaks, which I'm confused why they didn't think about that when they first left and were already getting shot at and before they started going through this town, but you know, I guess they've got some fuel for the other trucks. Now we've got a pretty difficult section to get through here, emotionally as well. You start with some locusts attacking from the tunnel you just arrived through earlier, but eventually they will start hooking up to your platform and then the former runner zombies also start attacking you from behind. And since that's not enough enemies, stalks also start popping up as well joining the fight, all with the common goal to solely fuck these six people up. There's limited cover around here, so you'll need to stay mobile to not get stuck somewhere and die when getting attacked from all sides. Survive for a certain amount of time, and we'd finally get a cutscene. I'd play the cutscene rather than talking, but YouTube doesn't like that, so here we are. But I'm sure you can practically hear this scene happening as you're watching it right now, assuming you all know what's coming. Everyone swaps platforms, but Dom gets stuck behind due to a stalk getting in the way, and he starts running out of ammo as everyone is getting surrounded. Dom, at this point, runs completely out of ammo, looks around him, sees a truck without his backside thanks to the stalk that moved it out the way. He then takes the truck, goes down a tunnel, screams that he's pulling the plug on all of them, much to Marcus's confusion, and then you hear him honking coming down the tunnel. He then crashes into the fuel depot, exploding everything and saving his friends. Marcus tries to get in there, but to no avail. It seemed like Dom had already accepted his fate long before that decision was even made. He already lost his kids, lost his wife, and he left behind his cog tags as well. I think most people went into this game expecting someone, and probably Dom, to die, but it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt seeing it, though. Seeing Marcus's reaction, I think, is what hurt me the most. Dom, yeah, it was sad, and it was touching seeing him at the statue and on his drive up talking to Maria, but holy shit, we've never
never seen Marcus look like this before. Like he's never looked this distraught before and it's always been stoicism and nothing has really phased him. But this, losing his friend, his closest friend, his brother, nothing has hurt him as much as this did. They get a moment, but they don't have much time to dwell as they still need to get out of here. So they arrive to Char just in time as they run out of gas right when they get here. This city looks absolutely fucked, all thanks to the hammer strikes. Turns out there's still people here trying to survive even after all of that. They get out of the truck and Marcus says that they're out of options and they need the fuel, whether the people here want that or not. Although you can hear in his voice how much different it sounds here, much lower and soft compared to how he normally is. He tells Dizzy to stay with the truck while they check out the city and as he walks away, they start talking behind his back, noticing his demeanor. He reassures him that they don't need to keep beating around the bush and to make sure he didn't die for nothing. Begin walking through and you see remaining humans now turn to statues of ash as a result of the hammer strikes, all still standing after all these years. Can't even imagine how terrifying it must have been seeing these large ass beams of destruction seconds before getting fried. Contact Dizzy, but you lose connection with him after a bit. Move forward and this ash man is trying to kill you with all these traps. He uses a spinning machine gun turret, shoots a propane tank next to you. Dude even pushes a box of polyps at you. I don't know how the hell he got those in there in the first place. He launches a shopping cart with a propane tank inside of it and the sound of a baby crying as a decoy with another spinning gun turret. Keep pushing and eventually you hear that they're coming and start getting shot at from a couple of protected turrets above you all. Marcus tries yelling at them to get them to stop shooting since they're just gears and not locusts, but they all continue anyway. Stalks rise and Lambent finally join the fight and then the turrets decide to stop shooting at you and at the Lambent helping you all out. Clear them out and the Ash Man comes down the elevator. He says Griffin doesn't want any outsiders in his city, especially any cog. They say they just want to trade for fuel. He makes a pass on Anya. Marcus nearly breaks the man's neck and he complies. He tells them to look at the mess that they've created from these hammer strikes and Sam is like, well, we saved you from the glowies just now. Like, is he supposed to say thank you for that? I guess yes, but she also acts as if this makes up for the decimation of the city or any of the other cities for that matter. He explained who Griffin is and he's apparently the leader here as he had a company named Griffin Emulsion Industries. Walk through some of the people staying here and I didn't mention it last time in Hanover, but it's funny just walking around and seeing some of these people repeat the same animation. I'm not saying this is criticism because I don't really care. They don't really add or take away anything from the game, I guess from realism, but this is a game that came out in 2011. It's just funny to see. Same with this woman here who says Cog must not all be that bad and lets you have access to some ammunition. You can see this woman appear like several times later, like some other NPCs, just to have characters fill up the space. Like I said, I don't really care. It's just funny seeing this woman's clones everywhere. You finally meet Griffin and I'm sure he became damn near everyone's favorite for the game as soon as he started talking. He shoes Ashman away and gloats about Griffin Tower still standing after all the strikes and chastises the Cog. Right before all this, Anya told Marcus to let her lead so you can just see this man is doing his damnness to keep his patience. Anya tries talking to him and he shoots her down as fast as hell. Marcus tries and Griffin says he doesn't have fuel as of right now because the people that he sent to go retrieve it never came back. And Griffin says that they can go get his fuel across the way and they can keep some of it if they go do that. Marcus asks if this is true and if they're being set up and he brings in Dizzy who was at the truck but clearly got abducted and he says that the truck has been taken as well. Griffin gives them an hour to go retrieve the fuel and then they can have Dizzy back and have what they need. They get outside and they see this massive crater in a city that must have been ground zero for the hammer strikes and Anya says they did a very thorough job. Jace says it must have been really hard to press that button and Anya admits that it was since she was there which would make a lot of sense and I'm surprised I didn't think about that possibility at all considering she's always been pretty high up in the cog. Fight through several Lambent and on this part in particular it made me realize just how vigilant Lambent forces are compared to Locust and I'm really glad that even though they're drones as well for the most part besides other mutations they all feel different to fight against. Lambent feel harder to deal with sometimes because they don't really care about cover like I've been saying. They will actively try and move around your cover to shoot you without regard for their own safety. They feel a lot more aggressive rather than Locust that do try to stay in cover for a bit longer except for when you start getting close like in the end game. It's a really nice change of pace fighting Lambent especially when they toss in bigger mutations or even Lambent wretches. You can't really fight them like normal ones otherwise you just blow up. Make your way inside and the power's off so you need to turn it on to get the elevator working unless you all want to scale the tower. Get the power on and Jace jinxes it for everybody and walkers start attacking as more elevators get called down. Take some stairs to a different elevator out back since these elevators are no longer a choice I guess and start moving up after moving this car out the way for the counterweight. Sam calls out the obvious saying that it's emulsion that's causing the problem but Jace brings up that practically everybody on the planet has been exposed but what's different Marcus points out is that these people were all in close contact with it for years refining the shit. Seconds later a gunker appears and just stay behind it and kill it or stay in front of it and let it cut the hell out of you. You kill it it explodes right in everybody's faces as they were just talking about exposure to emulsion and somehow the platform doesn't get destroyed.
Never mind. This is the first Gunker that any of these guys besides Sam has actually seen, so I'm surprised Jace is the only person that's like, what the fuck? But then again, like I said before, he's younger, and the amount of shit these people have probably seen at this point, it's just another big-ass dude to them. They get up top and find that the cable car won't move due to a safety cable. Move forward, get rid of some geeks, and I think if you listen closely, some of these are saying kill me in a very distorted way. I'll play a clip here so you can hear it. <laughs> If they are actually saying that, then that means that they're still a part of whoever there was before, and that's extremely sad if that is the case. That makes killing these punchers all the more upsetting, especially seeing just how many of them there are. Cut the cable and make it back to the car, then Dizzy contacts them somehow. He says that the queen has started attacking everybody, and you can see her fucking everybody up. It's a real good thing she didn't come to attack the cable car now, but she did leave behind a bunch of forces to finish the job. Defend from a couple barges on the way across, and if you look down, you can really get a good look at the sheer destruction the city faced all those years ago. Do you know how awful? Awful Anya and anybody else who was there that authorized those strikes must feel just to be still fighting these assholes all these years later. Anyway, the cable car brings you three levels below the roof where everyone is, yet there's guards everywhere to get through. Continue fighting and the clone girl gets cooked right in front of you. She actually managed to live my first time through here, but I died and reloaded and then she died the next time. Sorry, girly. Get up the ladder to the roof. Dizzy says that they're pinned down, get rid of some reinforcements and reach them and it's starting to seem like Dizzy and Griffin are the only survivors. And it turns out that they actually are are the only survivors. Literally everybody else that was here has died to the queen's attack besides these two. And Griffin is rightfully upset since these dudes did kind of bring the queen here knowing that they're being tracked by her. They didn't even think to let anybody know in the meantime. And sure, even if they were prepared, they probably still would have gotten ran through, but at least they could have tried. Before when I played this, I was young. So typically like most other young kids, I assume I would only look at the protagonist as the good or right character in any conflict that they find themselves in. So when I saw this scene when I was younger, I was like, oh yeah, Marcus just lost his brother and they're fighting a war out here. So cut the gears and slack when Griffin is getting upset with him. But at the same time, they have directly as well as indirectly caused the deaths of so many innocent people in their wake to where it becomes really hard to defend them. Such is the case with war. There aren't always necessarily good or bad guys, just dudes with orders. And those orders, despite having a great goal, still affect other people. They may have not planned to get all of Griffin's people killed, but to Griffin and in general, it doesn't really matter. They still died as casualties of the war that these gears take part in and he stranded clearly wanted nothing to do with that. So when Marcus is yelling at this man that Don Mom just died like an hour ago, Griffin also lost everybody here as a result. There isn't really a measure for losses in war, but it's impossible to have a war with zero losses, and comparing them does nothing as they're all losses regardless of what side you're on. Griffin says they'll settle this at another time, and pieces the fuck out. And man, I've been holding out on when they're gonna bring this motherfucker back, but at the time of this video, we've got all these Gears games out and not one sign of Griffin, so that's depressing. They leave and arrive to the Navy shipyard, and the Queen sees him coming in and says that their entire species will die if he's succeeds and commands three new locusts that we've never seen before to stop him. They've got some armor on, but they leave pretty quickly, and I'm confused why if she sees them driving a truck, something with considerably less protection than anything else they've been on prior to now, why doesn't she just attack them with the beetle right now and kill them? Like, it's not like she's trying to spare them. She clearly wants these people dead. And I get, oh, get your minions to do it, but she literally took the initiative two times herself earlier in the game in attempt to kill all these guys, so why not now? All right, I guess we still have a few chapters left, and we haven't been to Azura yet so I guess she's also waiting on that too. I get it. They arrive to the shipyard and they're immediately met with locust reinforcements, all under the queen to stop you. Now that we're here, you can see that all the locusts that you're gonna encounter from now on will not look like the savage locusts from earlier in the game. This is important, but we'll get there later on, even though you can already assume what I'm gonna say later on. While we're out here, I really appreciate the small detail of an auto walk while in cover with this moving cart here. Before, like say in Gears 2, you had to move with the rock worm and shoot at the same time with your analog stick, but here you can shoot and it'll walk you forward with the cart automatically. Just a small improvement I thought I should point out. Fight your way to the hangar and the first sub you see looks screwed with weird webs all over it and obviously you're gonna see what makes these very soon. So soon actually, you move on to the next hangar and you're met with a giant therapy. These guys crawl everywhere after everyone and shock you with its mouth. Once again, another enemy causing you to have to constantly change cover or move around the area. You can't shoot them directly as they have armor on top, but they're exposed at their glowing tails, so continue shooting them in the ass until they run out of a body and they'll die. Get through here to the next hangar and find a submarine that 
it looks functioning that the locust for some reason didn't just decide to destroy despite them sitting right outside of the room that you just got from. Dizzy checks it out and sees that they need a rotor and some fuel so they let you decide which one you want to get first. It doesn't really matter because you're going to be doing both of them anyway. I chose to get the fuel first, push through some locusts, then you get to a dock and find a silverback and then you see a boat with the fuel on it. Move to the brow or ramp for those like me that don't know what the hell a brow was to get on the boat. Kill the guards then find a control room in the back and move the fuel with the crane. Get rid of an incoming barge and reinforcements and they make it back to the sub. The fuel arrives and then now you go get the rotor. Pass some wretches, get up to two turrets and typically you're supposed to push these tanks towards them but it only worked once for me. After that they kept shooting it and I just blew up instead so it never really worked for me. But whatever, get through the door up ahead, go up a lift, shoot some more reinforcements, get through locusts in the maintenance bay and find the rotor. Use the loader that's waiting right here on time for us to use it. Bring the rotor, fight some more. I didn't check what would happen if the loader was destroyed but I'm Pretty sure it would cause a game over, right? I guess, because you're holding the rotor in your hand. Get back to Dizzy, and now we escort the sub to the maintenance door. Right here, with the locust right behind them. So were they just ready here? It makes total sense if that is the case, but why didn't they just attack the sub? Or Dizzy? We already left Dizzy alone once. I'm surprised they left him alone again with the sub, knowing that they're being tracked. Eventually get to the end, and those enemies that we saw earlier are now here to stop you. They wield two Gorgon pistols, and they have armor on. So when you shoot at them, their bullets are just going to bounce off, much like the Serapedes. As you could probably tell, they're just called Armored Cantus and they have two weaknesses. One, two, any explosions that they'll take damage from. And two, when they take enough damage, they'll start to screech like a normal Cantus, but his mouth becomes the weak spot. These assholes are pretty tough, as I died many, many, many times. But while they are tough, they aren't impossible, which of course is obvious, but it certainly did not feel like that. These guys will get up in your face, ignoring your cover, and sometimes roll towards you, doing damage and stunning you, or just killing you on higher difficulties. They aren't super difficult, but this part specifically was just horrendous due to your starting position. They start right here in front of you, and you only have have these four small ass blocks as cover which they can just easily walk around or roll past or kick over so you clearly can't stay put once again but being on a move feels rough at times if they get a lock on you with these dual wielded gorgon they just melt you shortly after the armored cantus therons will rush in and your best bet is killing them and using their torque bows on the cantus for explosives after killing the first one then they start throwing serapes at you this part certainly made me upset like just having little cover having to run around the entire place was frustrating as hell it definitely it stumped me for at least like four 40 minutes. It was insane. You get rid of everybody eventually and fill the area with water for the sub. Then Anya calls Cole. They update each other and Anya almost breaks the news to them but waits and Marcus says he'll tell them about Dom later when they meet up with him. And after seeing Anya like this here, I want to say I like this little bit of dialogue Sam and Marcus shared earlier. Sam, you doing okay? No, I'm not. And neither are you. Yeah, that's about the size of it. But we'll keep going, right? For him. It shows that they're really torn and upset about Dom's death. And of course, like, yeah, they would be, but if they didn't have any dialogue or express how they felt about Dom's death, then it'd feel like his death didn't matter or like you could easily forget about it. But you can just see and hear how much his death has affected these guys. And yeah, they're still pushing through this. Now when the sub, we're sitting here in each of these defense pods or whatever they're called, as we all have these turrets for each pod with Dizzy driving. You see another city that was sank, most likely due to the locusts and that big ass worm. And they reflect on Jacinto, saying that it probably looks the same, but that they did it to themselves this time and that they can't change the past. They start moving through a cog minefield and see a few leviathans swimming around and they appear friendly but very shortly they start attacking you and you need to defend against them. Defend against them for a while then Dizzy brings you guys in some cover amongst some plants and shit then he turns the lights off so they can't see you. They then hear something in the water and it's a full grown leviathan that nearly kills them. Dizzy had just said he was watching the sonar so did he not see that coming. Defend against it and eventually head for the minefield to get it off of you guys and then also get rid of those mines as well. You guys get inside a tunnel later, you'll shoot its mouth a couple times and it'll try to get behind you, trying to drag you guys with its tail. Shoot it away, then you guys get sucked into a current along with mines. Dizzy gets you all through, hitting no mines or even walls or anything. Next, there's some torpedo turrets, protection sponsored by the cog, of course, indicating that you're getting close to Azura. You get past those turrets, come up to a giant ass door, blast it down, get past some more turrets, and you're in. Now now you're in Azura, and the first thing you see is a mass watery grave. All these civilians that Prescott had moved to Azura for safety now all executed by the locusts that took over. Textbook irony there. The people he cared less about to save were all the ones who have and are continuing to survive outliving these people. Dizzy stays back again because we can't have five players and I guess he needs to watch the sub. Clearly this is act five and this is the end of the game, but there's so much gameplay and story left that it feels so much longer. The past two games, act five goes by in like an hour or so, and this act five is long. And 
and I love it. Clear out some Therons, wretches, and come up to the train terminal. Train blows the fuck up, and now they're stuck, so Anya tries calling Cole, clearly to no avail due to the storm outside, but then Adam Phoenix picks up. They talk to him through the security camera, and he gets to see his son again. He hasn't seen him in so long, he doesn't even recognize the scar. He says he's locked in a hotel tower, and he needs to deploy the countermeasure as he's running out of time. Time for what, you ask? Apparently, the Lambent are evolving and are about to enter a critical stage in its life cycle, which will mature and destroy all life on Sarah. Yeah, wow. It's essentially a parasite, and he's got a way to kill it, but Mira wants the Lambent killed without affecting the Locust at all, and he doesn't think that that's possible with the time given. He opens a maintenance tunnel to use, find a silverback to use in there, and start killing. Keep killing whatever's in the way, you get outside, and you get to see this giant maelstrom, this fake storm covering the entire island, and it looks fucking amazing. It's so silent out here, like there's no music playing the entire time that you're outside, it's just the sound of the storm. It's kind of nice, honestly. And once again, for a game that came out in 2011, I like the way this looks. Chuck through like a thousand locusts or some shit, make it to another train area, get through the tunnel before a train runs you guys over. Now you're in a maelstrom facility and they're realizing that all those scientists that they thought were killed were just brought here but they still ended up dying. Use an elevator up and fight your way through the facility and finally come across some flame grenadiers again. Haven't seen you guys in a long time. You're in this maze-like area and the lights are off. Find out where the lights are, turn them on, and find out where you need to go indicated by more enemies. Burn them up and go up an elevator and you're back outside. And then you can finally see what's projecting this storm. Kill those in front of you and make it to a nicer looking elevator and you're in the generator room now. Adam tells us that there's three switches to turn off and Marcus apologizes for failing and tells him that, that Dom is gone. He gives his condolences and he says he won't fail this time and we see a flask of emulsion next to him. Burn through these guys, see another coal train thrash foosball table and get to the generator room. Shut down the three generators in here and it doesn't turn off, unsurprisingly, as the locusts probably have a backup somewhere. And now they need to close off five coolant lines, although it'll cause an explosion, of course. What would shutting down some system be without its inescapable yet still escapable explosion? Shut down two while more locusts start defending against you all, head downstairs, make it past some more armored cantus. I think the last armor cantus you see for the rest of the game actually and shut down the last few generators now you all have a minute to get out start running back to the exit shoot the poor dude that thought he was going to try and stop you guys and you guys make it out and just like that the storm is gone and the sun comes out the time of darkness is almost over and all they need to do is finish it adam is freaking out and they quell him very quickly they get in contact with baird and they bring a lot of reinforcements with them including the uir the COG's former enemy. They come in on a chopper and they got Jack working, which is great, but like I said, if you remember, Jack was on the ship and I'm pretty sure the ship blew the fuck up. They notice Dom and Dizzy are missing. Marcus tells them where Dizzy is and tells them that Dom didn't make it and their reactions are, pretty accurate. Marcus then tells Sam and Jace to go help with landing troops. Jace tries to stay and help, but because only four people can play at a time, him and Sam have to head back. Start heading up this mountain, and there's a King Raven supporting you for a time while you're going up. <laughs> at least we got air support for a change. They finally got air support after all these years. Get through a lot of the guards with Jack entering the fight, and within like three minutes, your air support's gone due to the siege beast, so they tell everybody to hold off until they deal with all the anti-air. Get rid of the siege beast and use it to get rid of some barges, and there's more, so they need to go get those as well. Get into the hotel, walk up and all the scientists except Adam were executed since they only needed him. Adam says this and then says he can explain about Mira but Marcus cuts him off because they're conveniently in a time crunch. I'd still want him to explain what he meant by that but I guess we have locusts to kill so another time. I mean he could talk to us while we're shooting the locusts but you know whatever. Come outside to the dam where the next set of siege beasts are and take out the one that's closest to you then take out some reavers above and other beasts across from you by destroying the dam. Escape that and in the next room over Marcus asks what they'll need to do once they get him out. He says he only needs the keys and Baird asks the important question here, how did, exactly does this work? Prescott mentioned Baird to Adam at one point apparently showing how smart Baird must be yet he had to stay and fight and couldn't be one of those scientists that got taken to reserve although he would have just died so I guess it's good that he's not an important enough scientist. He explains it works like a neutron bomb without the blast and will only kill lambent cells and everyone and Baird's just like okay. They ambush you from the rooftops and the doors left in the next room. Beat them down, get outside. Okay I lied there's some more armored cantus here. Same process kill everybody here, take over the siege beast, use it against him, kill some more, and boom. Marcus lets her know they clear to land now, and they push the beast off, and wow, that's really gotta suck, because he's, it's gonna hurt on impact, and that dude's gonna drown. But anyway, right on cue, lambent stalks rise, and they get away for now. Okay, I don't know if I've said it yet, or enough, but this entire last section of the game is my favorite, just on pure aesthetics alone. For a game that came out in 2011, over a decade ago now, Azura and this entire hotel looks absolutely stunning. The gold accents everywhere look so clean, the greenery looks really beautiful everywhere, the actual structural design of the hotel is phenomenal. They definitely went all out here at the end of the game, and it surely paid off, as it still looks pretty all these years later. Once again, 
again for a 360 game. It's not gonna look like your everyday games nowadays, obviously, but it looks pretty good for what it is. Beard tries asking how Dawn passed and Marcus says, let's just wait until the end. Anya shares her feelings about Prescott as she was lied to and had this palace, yet Marcus brings an interesting point is that Marcus stayed with him for the majority of the war since he didn't disappear until after the flood, which is very interesting, although I'd still be pretty upset. Get to an elevator and Baird keeps displaying his uncertainty with everything. Marcus says no one else is gonna die and dismisses the chance of Adam's device not working. Reasonable to question since he technically hasn't met the man and is unaware of his testing and all this information is new, but they all agree to just have faith about it and keep it pushing. You got a mortar, Theron, some more armored Cantus. Okay, I certainly lied a little bit earlier when I said there was no more. There's still some armored Cantus around. They're not extinct yet. I don't know why I only thought that there were like five in the game, even though I've died to these guys so many times. You'd think I remember this shit by now, but I think I blocked it out of my head for a reason. Fight forward and eventually the Lambent catch up with you and defend against them until Jack rips the door. Baird insists again, noting that they all have emulsion in them and how would they not be affected. And Adam chimes in and says that it's been tested and that it will work. Adam says he's trapped in the top tower of the hotel like fucking Princess Peach or some shit and they ask what Mira is up to. He says the blast will kill the emulsion and harm the locust. Interesting he said harm and not kill the locust. Marcus says he doesn't really see the downside to this and Adam replies that he just needed more time like E-Day, which raises all sorts of questions. They decide to start chugging through as they do have a score to settle. Therons, boomers, blood mounts, reavers, get to the elevator, it doesn't work. Baird starts working on it and Adam comes back and says he's responsible for the deaths of so many. He says he wishes they could have talked it through, I guess as opposed to war. They don't ask what he wanted to talk about though. He's dropping so much subtly and just leaving it there. Like talk about what exactly and with whom. We assume as of now, Queen Mira, as she's the only one we know he's clearly been in contact with, but we just don't know what he's talking about for sure. Baird cuts him off because fuck whatever Adam was talking about and ask him if they're gonna feel anything when his blast goes off. And he says as long as they aren't feeling sick, then they should be fine. Basically not on the verge of the yellow humans. Stalks attack while they wait for elevators to work, get on the elevator and they split up. Stop the hookers and defend against all the other locusts around you. Marcus and Anya's elevator crashes into the other coincidentally and they get on top safely. And they're separated by floor. Start ascending up the stairs and the queen busts through a window. It seems like Mira also likes dropping important information as she says she gave Adam 20 years to deal with the Lambent. So let's pause. We're in a current year of 17 after E-Day. Yet Mira says Adam had three years prior to Emergence Day to deal with the Lambent. The general population wasn't even aware of Locust, let alone the Lambent at this time. Of course, if you've played the fifth game, then you know, but as of now, hearing this and thinking this was gonna be the last game we were gonna get out of this franchise and having no explanation was just torture. And back then, I didn't really know that there were books, so I just played the games. Baird also hears this and Marcus again tells him not to listen to her. I'm sorry, but there's too many questions to be asked for this man Marcus to blindly push forward like this. The queen says that the locusts have a right to the world as much as they do. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And they discuss their plan to take her down right in front of her as she watches y'all do it, essentially. I mean, she uses Tempest to try and stop y'all. She essentially doesn't move after seeing you guys take out the first, second, and even third cable. Drop the chandelier or whatever on her head and catch the elevator. Adam asks if they're all right and they say that the problem's been solved. And he and everybody else just assume that Mira is dead. And Adam almost sounds sad of hearing this. Adam says there's locusts outside the room, so they stop at a different floor and flank them. Baird asks questions we need answers to, and Cole just thinks that she was joking around. Sounded a little real for it to be a joke, but all right. Now you guys are on the same floor as Adam with all these forces defending his door. Rip through all these guys. They even have a turret back here. They even got two sets of lasers on his door with the switches in adjacent rooms. Disable them both and get in, and they finally get to meet Adam. Him and Marcus have their father-son moment for like three seconds. He starts talking like someone that's anticipating death in like 30 minutes, saying you all need to live once this is over and Marcus is like, okay, let's go. And Adam says if he had more time due to the emulsion life cycle, he could have saved the locust too. Marcus asks if he feels sorry for these locusts and he just says he feels responsible because he failed to stop the emulsion from spreading those 20 years ago, which we learn now is a reason for Emergence Day. They were already dealing with the Lambent conflict and they were getting forced out. And they have been fighting this entire time before most humans even knew that emulsion was the issue outside of the Pendulum Wars. The Lambent to me feel a lot like the Whites from Game of Thrones, causing a wedge between an ongoing war between between other existing factions, except we won't talk about how Game of Thrones ended their conflict with the Night King, cause yeah. Anyways, Baird is justifiably upset that no one knew but the cog, but apparently Adam was the only person who knew, not even Prescott. Baird asks what else is there, and Adam gives him a disc and says he can figure out what Adam's goals were all those years ago. Just more disc for Baird to figure out. He's gotta be tired of being the smart guy all the time, or maybe not. Cole says it's time to go, and it is. The Lambin are outside, and they need to get back up to the elevator and make it up to the top, where that device is. Now you guys are all at the top, and this is the end. Adam's device is this giant thing, and they're up here to defend him. Carmine also joins in the fight 
fight providing air support in the end. Get rid of the Lambent and Adam gets to the device and starts. Right then Mira appears cause she's not dead and shoots Carmine out of the sky. Is he dead? Hmm. She starts attacking you all and Adam says that the device will take a while so you've got a long fight ahead of you. And the sky starts getting dark in real time just like earlier on in the game with the gas barges and I love it. Adam reaches another stage and he's got all these pillars with Hammer of Dawns ready here. Was he prepared for this exact situation? Deal with the Sun God Beetle by avoiding like you always have and shoot it in the mouth then hammer it down when it falls. Next time it falls Queen's guards arrive so you need to deal with them as well while avoiding the Tempest. Again you can't stay in one place or you're certainly gonna die when getting burnt or getting shot in your ass. Every time she falls for hammer time more Therons attack. Adam eventually reaches a critical point and Mira just starts going ape shit on a device because at this point for Mira it's either humans die or they all die for her. Shoot her off and repeat the same steps as before. Burn them enough the Tempest will eventually fall and the device activates. It's now that Baird asks how he tested it exactly and he injected himself with emulsion. He accelerated the process in himself to study it for the device. The Lambent start attacking and a blast goes off and they all start to fall. Marcus tries saving him again not recognizing Adam's words at all. He says he was happy to see him again and tells him all to live again and he dies with the next blast as all his cells get disintegrated. Right after Queen Mira rises. I guess not Queen anymore just Mira. She criticizes Adam for all his decisions and Marcus guts her with Dom's knife and she's done. The final blast goes off and we get to see the ripple effects. All the Lambent are dying, disintegrating, and the Locusts are dying, but just falling to the ground. We see a crash helicopter and a helmet. Someone picks it up and it's Carmine, showing that he survived the entire game thanks to everybody who voted for his life. Everyone is celebrating the end and Marcus is still distraught, strips his armor and rests on the beach. Anya accompanies him, reassuring him she's there. He feels empty now because the war is over and he wonders what else is after. The fight's over. And she says that they finally have a tomorrow. Without the threat of extinction, they finally have a tomorrow. I don't know how many games, if any at all, that have ever made me feel euphoric yet confused at the same time. The ending didn't feel rushed at all, but we were hit with a lot of information within the last couple of hours that felt a bit important, but at the same time, since the conflict was technically over, it didn't really matter. I remember finishing for the first time in 2012 and just feeling great that the queen's been gutted, the locusts have been defeated, emphasis on defeated, and the lambent have been wiped out instantly. The conflict was over and they were finally able to experience peace for the first time in decades, yet we still have these burning questions that haven't been answered. The queen, for a very strong start, she looks human with locust clothing, talking like a human, has, well, you know, she's certainly a woman. As we know, the berserkers are the she's technically. Well, she's clearly not a berserker, but she's dead, so we can't really ask her. Then we have Adam. He knew about the Lambent threat three years prior to E-Day and clearly had been in contact with Mira around that time. So how long did they know each other for and fucking how? He ran out of time to stop the Lambent from driving the locusts out and ran out of time to assist humans from those locusts, causing mass casualties with his very own Hammer of Dawn. Don't have time to ask him any details either, since now he looks like people he's practically responsible for incinerating. So the two people with all the answers to these questions are both dead. So we were stuck with accepting this sweet yet bitter ending. Well, I can't even say bitter because I'm not even really upset. Not at all. I mean, as far as we know, all threats have been eliminated, so there isn't really much point in dwelling in the past since now there's a guaranteed future ahead for these people. And I'm glad it's for everyone as well. Except, you know, Dom. I think we all saw this coming, though, after just seeing him through the story. Especially reading this. This is a report you can find at the beginning of the game on his mental health, and it says that someone should keep an eye on him, as he's probably had many suicidal thoughts and clearly struggling with survival. This, of course, does not mean his death didn't hit like a truck at all. I, for one, had his death spoiled for me by a friend who thought it was funny to blurt that shit out, but it still hurt playing through it. Seeing him make up his mind so fast, especially after dropping his tags, was hard. But like I said before, it seemed like he was ready for that moment a long time ago. But aside from Dom, every Everyone else has made it safely. Marcus, Anya, Baird, Cole, Sam, Jace, Dizzy, and Hoffman too, his old ass, and fucking Carmine. Thanks to our voting, he got to live as well. While it makes sense in the context of the story, I wish we got to see more of the Lambent before them turning into vapor so fast. We got to see a lot of variety from the Lambent forces, but the two notable ones were the Leviathan and the Berserker. They were both really cool to see, more so the Berserker, but I wish we got more. Pretty much everything past Griffin is just straight Locust, except for the end when they start joining in the fight in Azura. And even then, they weren't many to fight. And that would have been a great time to either have another berserker or just more lambent forces in general. And like I said, with context, it makes sense. They're on an island where the lambent haven't been to yet until just now, and they're on a time limit to get Adam and deploy that countermeasure against the lambent. But honestly, they're just fun and cool to see and fight against in a game, because I really love how they shake up the monotony of the combat. So I wish we saw more. This certainly isn't to say I didn't like seeing the locusts
Cantus here in the game. I love the new additions they made with the giant Serapes, the armor Cantus, those ashy ass corpsers, and even the Shriekers are pretty fun to shoot down. Seeing all the savage locusts and then the actual locusts that Mira decided to keep with her was really cool to see. Just like the Cog, the locusts had nowhere to go after the flood and were also abandoned by their own leader, leaving them to fend for themselves, thus becoming savage locusts. They have no rules or hierarchies here, as we see Theron seem to be on the same level as the other savage locusts around here instead of being elites like they once were. You don't normally see a Theron using a Butcher Cleaver. After the first and second game, this one is such a great conclusion to the original trilogy. Experiencing all these games through Marcus, seeing him go from ex-war hero and being court-martialed to practically saving all of humanity was amazing to see throughout these three games. We saw these characters go through hell and back, with a few exceptions, and each time they persevere and now they finally achieve peace. This game was everything I wanted out of a Gears game for its time. Amazing multiplayer, amazing customization options, Beast and Horde mode were great, and the campaign was spectacular. They even had a- wait a minute, did I go this entire video without talking about the ROM Shadow DLC? I honestly don't know how the hell I forgot about this. It's literally right here. Well, okay then, the video isn't over yet. Go make some more snacks, we still got more to talk about. Since this video is already fuck knows how long, we're gonna do this with some speed. There's only a few chapters and a couple things to talk about, so I won't really go into detail like I did with the campaign. This DLC takes place before Gears of War 1, way before Gears 1, in fact. It's right after E-Day. This side story follows the four Gears of Zeta Squad in their attempt to evacuate Alima City from the Locust Threat. The group consists of Commander Min Kim and Tai Kaliso, both of who we already know, Alicia Valera, someone we haven't seen before, as well as Michael Barrick, another we haven't met before, but is the main character and who you'll be playing as for this DLC. We're first given a cutscene with Barrick, and it shows us a lot of krill in the sky, and it cuts to before all of that. Zeta is shown here helping some civilians evacuate, apparently to avoid the krill storm when the day turns to night. The escort vehicles drive like 20 feet, and they're attacked from underground by a corpser. Everyone needs to hold them off for now until reinforcements arrive. Eliminate a number of locusts and reavers with some emergence holes, because now they're back before you only saw locusts jumping out of the ground. Eventually get to the command post with the hammer of dawn and get rid of the remaining forces. Command tells him that a squad needs help evacuating some civvies at a bank nearby as they lost contact with that squad. Throughout this DLC, they converse with each other about the ongoing situation, and in turn, we get to hear more about their background since we don't know these people at all. Lima turns out to be Valera's hometown, which is also the city we saw sink in Gears of War 2 to that worm. And we're starting to get the sense that Barrick is sort of a hothead as his first instinct is to fight, as he states the cog should be doing to the locust and tries to immediately square up to a Brumach when their current task is to help evacuation. Come up to the courtyard in front of the bank and help some of the cog who so happens to be Echo Squad. They never even made it inside the building. There was also just some random dude here. He died, even though we got here in time to help him at least. You guys get attacked again, you get rid of him, and then you move inside. So we're already running into issues with the game, at least surface level issues. The issue of doing prequels, but still including enemies that only showed up in certain entries. For example, we're here fighting Blood Mouse, but these guys don't show up until Gears of War 2. Did they have Blood Mouse and just decided not to use them in the areas we explored in the first game? Or did they start training for Blood Mounts after Gears 1 and into Gears 2? I don't really know the answer. The time difference between Gears 1 and Gears 2 isn't even a full year, so I feel like they most likely had Blood Mounts before Gears 2, but was it as early as E-Day? Same argument can be said for Giant Serapedes as we see them later in the DLC. Although since these are native to Sarah, I don't know what I can really say about that one, other than they just didn't include these creatures until this game. Not so much that Serapedes didn't exist at all those times, because that wouldn't make sense either. It's just interesting that they never came across these guys in any of the games previous. I'm sure they're native to Sarah, but we just didn't see them at all. Make another joke about Kim having the code to the door and they get inside. Eventually make way to the vault underground while Ty keeps talking in phrases. Downstairs, Jack gives you access to the vault and then you're attacked. So it's just now occurring to me that there can be multiple Jacks. I don't know why I thought Jack was just only one guy and he was just upgraded over time. Clear out the vault and burn all the money that can be burned because some of it's flame proof apparently. And you hear a familiar voice. Open up the vault and it turns out that Jace is stuck in here. Pretty cool we're getting some origin story for Jace here. This DLC made me like him a lot more. They explain the current situation to him and we get a cutscene switching perspective to Locust emerging from the ground thanks to a corpser and we see the man himself, Rom. I don't know about you, but being able to play as Rom was not something I was expecting to be possible before hearing about this when the DLC was announced, but it was a pleasant surprise nonetheless. There's three sections where you get to play as Rom and if you have friends, they get to play as the Theron Elite and the Mahler Brothers. You're given objectives directly from the Queen as you hear her speaking to you telepathically, which I don't know how that works and I don't recall it ever being said to us before that that's something that they can do. Maybe it's somewhere amongst the collectibles that I've missed along the way, but I mean, we've seen Cantus raise them from the ground before, so we know this isn't something that we're surprised by. The Queen is directing you and your crew to go to various locations around the town, eliminate cog forces, and call cedars to the surface in order to ink the sky in preparation for the krill storm. So there's like three things you can do as Rom. You can charge and stab with his iconic knife, like a retro charge. You can melee slash with the knife, and you can control and direct your krill to a specific target. Oh, and you can do executions as well. Only two of them. Cutting off their head or the normal curb 
reserve stomp. And he also has a krill shield that scatters when you've taken any explosive or fire damage or anytime you shoot them at somebody else. So you'll end up being vulnerable. So I found it pretty cool to play as Rom, but I'd honestly be lying if I said I didn't get bored with his gameplay after the first time playing with him. The next few times just have increasingly difficult encounters like more diva mechs and then they start using explosives or fire on you. So it does make you have to think about what you're doing. So you can die very quickly if you're not being careful enough. But the only thing you can do is point krill and slash with the knife. It's fun for the first few times, but then it gets kind of boring. And that's not something I thought I would say about being able to play as Rom. And in their defense, it's not like I can really think of what else they could have done to make it more enjoyable past the first few checkpoints. And he doesn't just casually walk around with a minigun. Only thing I wish they would have done is have an execution be almost similar to the way he killed Kim. But that would have just been fan service. And honestly, it just shows how disrespectful that shit was to him. But more on that later. Mira explains that this effort is to eventually strip the capital from the cog so that they have no more support. Eliminate the rest of the cog and the cedars begin inking the skies. We switch perspectives back to where we left off with Zeta and now we know why these rumblings were happening in the first place. Chuck through some locusts and they see Nemesis inking the skies at the evac area so their objective is to get rid of them. Get to the cedars and just demolish the front side of a building to kill them so a caravan can get through the streets. But then next there's a Brumach that starts taking everybody out. You take him out and he blows up the entire building and the caravan is somehow fine. They get Jason on one of them and he says that his dad is at the school so they agree to go check it out. They head to the school and notice that it was another evac checkpoint that hasn't checked in with command since the attack started, so that's not a good sign. They start talking to each other, and you can tell Barrick did not have a good time during his school years. Command tells him that the Krill are coming and that they should head back, and they say, nah, we're just gonna keep searching. Dr. Wisen comes on the intercom, but it sounds pretty screwed up. They decide to go search for him. Eventually, you make your way downstairs to another part of the school. Some wretch grows a brain cell and traps you all in here. Also, this academy is freaking massive. I wish my school would have been this huge, although that would have been a lot of walking. Eventually, Dr. Wisen on the intercom says to make way for the gym because they're leaving to go to the orphanage. Get to a cafeteria of tickers, including some more wild tickers that, uh, apparently eat grenades. Yeah, imagine my face when I found this out. They tell you early on in the game that they actually eat items. I just didn't know that they would carry a grenade to you after eating it. That's pretty insane. Arrive to a room full of dead kids. Now I'm gonna just play this part. Oh my god. How many? Did any of them make it? I'm not sure. Damn it. We couldn't even protect an evac point with kids in it. The COG does what it can for its people, Corporal. That's why we're here. Keep moving. The COG does what it can for its people? Well, I'll tell you what the COG did for me. The COG blew up my house. The COG destroyed everything I had. And when I was stranded and had no other choices, the COG gave me a gun and sent me here to do the same thing to someone else. This was your home once, Val. Is the cog doing what it can for you? I don't know, Barak. The locusts are real. Those krill are real. Every life we save today is something special. It's another chance for someone. Barak is certainly within his rights to feel the way that he does, yet Alicia makes a very good point. All they can do now is help the ones that they can in the current time. You make it to the gym, a berserker attacks, I presume he was just stuck in a closet somewhere. You get it outside into a parking lot and you burn it with car explosions as you don't have the hammer of dawn and you shoot it while it's exposed. Back to making mincemeat out of all the cog as Rom and make space for the cedars. They drop off some onyx guard and they get the same treatment, effectively making zero difference as onyx guards compared to the cog. After getting the cedars out, then it's back to Zeta. It's a bit of a shorter section with Rom that time. As I said before, there isn't much to do with him other than stand and shoot birds or bats, whatever. They get to the area that Rom just churned through and retake it. They eventually see Nemesis above City Hall and decide to break in using the Hammer of Dawn system in the back to take out the Cedars. Fight in this very well-designed garden, die a certain amount of times, and get inside. Tear through some more reinforcements that I'm now wondering why they didn't just use the hammer on the cog since they had access to the controls in here, unless they need a code to use for the system. I don't see why they just stand around this very useful weapon that they know has been used against them before. You said weapon on the cedars outside and you've got to fight your way back out. They get out and have comms back on but they find out that the evacuation has ended and there's only 20 minutes left before the krill storm starts. Control says that there's been a full retreat ordered and Kim denies that and says that they need to go save the principal on all the orphans. Now fighting through a construction site, use a loader to pass, buy some turrets and get rid of their remaining forces here. Use a crane and arrive to the orphanage and the APC arrives to get you all and Jace back in time and they're immediately shot at. I like how they sort of redid the shot from the first game with Kim having his back turned here 
again with Rom closing in on him. Except this time he picks up Jace and Alicia gets in a way to save him. But uh, yeah, she didn't make it. Rom gets on his reaver and Jace picks up her lancer, ready to fight, getting his first blood immediately. The car gets destroyed and they get separated from the orphanage, so they begin to work their way back. They've got a shitload of elites to burn through, including a Theron elite that they catch a glimpse of in a distance. Move forward and they put you in an open area and now you have to take on that elite. He's also been given a shield of krill to protect himself and he's going to run around tossing and dropping krill inks on you while shooting torque bows at you. Oh, there's also tickers here. The fight isn't really difficult. He just got a lot of health and runs around a lot. But you finish him off with an execution and start making way to the orphanage again. Rom has a reaver that instead of shooting rockets, it shoots krill inks like before. Retake the area from the locust and Rom falls in the sickest way and he starts attacking all of you. He'll use his krill finger on you. You have to manage him with e-holes popping up on either side of you. He eventually gets back on his reaver and he's got what like gold elite reavers with him they look cool as hell but i don't really know what the significance of them being here was shoot down his reaver and they all get to the roof for evac but kim stays behind for vengeance and it's funny that i thought barrack was the hothead when kim is the one that charges in here without thinking barrack's the one that also says you got to know when to turn tail something that kim didn't know how to do which caused him his death in the first game he goes to try and cut him down instead of just shooting him for whatever reason and barrack delays the inevitable they all arrive on a raven and they make it out safely and that's the rom dlc once again when this game was a release the last thing i expected was a dlc let alone one that would let us play with rom himself it wasn't too long of a dlc but it didn't feel too short either although that being said i do wish it was longer but i think the length was fine where it was seeing jace's origin was pretty cool to see since for most players the third game was the first time being introduced to this guy even though we technically hear him for the first time in a second game when we were underground it was also cool to get more of ty and kim both characters that were taken away pretty fast from us in the past games I also like barrack as a character and as someone i wish i got more out of he didn't have the best childhood nor upcoming which he blames the cog entirely for we've known the cog isn't the best government but i wish there were more characters like barrack who openly share their disdain for the people that put them up against the locust valera mm, i can't say i really cared for her character that much and i mean it's only a few chapters so of course there isn't much they could stick in there without derailing the story but i feel like we could have gotten more of a shared dialogue like we got out of barrack the most we know is that she has a brother that just got enlisted but we don't know who that is she was sort of a blank character to me kind of just a woman on a team for the sake of having a woman there although i think the purpose of her character was the impact that she had on Jace. She saved Jace here, giving him another chance, and he went on to help saving the world, essentially, in the end. Every life we save today is something special. It's another chance for someone. This DLC was a pretty decent one overall, but that's not to say it didn't have its problems that, to this day, have not been fixed in 2023. There were a couple of times where my game would just fail me for someone dying, but more importantly, a drone dying. Yes, an enemy drone died, and it made me fail the game. When this popped up, I had to make sure I wasn't just seeing shit. I thought maybe one of the COG died, but they just accidentally put drone here instead of like Ty or something like that but no all of my teammates were alive at this point and I think I actually heard or saw the actual drone die and it just failed me for it I have no idea why this was an issue. Thankfully, it didn't happen again. There was also another point where I died and the game just refused to let me restart from the checkpoint. I didn't do anything different or wrong here and Iron Man mode wasn't a thing until the fourth game, so I don't really know why this happened. I just chose to go back to the main menu and go back in to see if it would make me restart, but it put me back where I was before, so I guess it got solved, but I have no idea why that happened and I couldn't really get it to replicate either. There was also this section here where my game just bugged out. I just went up to this cover and I started shooting and my screen just froze. I could still hear the audio and the music Music and me shooting but the screen was just frozen I was even able to go to my Xbox dashboard and everything but I couldn't move the game forward after a couple minutes I was finally able to move but I don't know why this happened either I've read other people that have had these issues before so hopefully these kinds of things will be fixed whenever they do an update for these older games or a remake you know hopefully one day still crossing our fingers for that one like I said earlier we have a lot of unanswered questions still here after finishing the third game remember this game was supposed to be the last of the gears games we didn't even know we were getting judgment until a little bit later and even then judgment is a prequel so at least for myself I wasn't expecting answers out of that game so after ending with the third game i felt like we had all these unknown things just floating here where did the locust even come from who exactly is mira and why is she the only human looking one what really happened at mount kadar and what was up with a worm in gears of war 2 and are there more worms what was adam's involvement in all of this in the past some of these questions i'm sure are answered in the books and some we sort of know the answers or have implications of but since we now have gears judgment 4 and 5 and the hive busters dlc that i still haven't fully played yet hopefully we'll find the answers we're looking for so 
so stay tuned. If you've made it this far in the video, then truly thank you. Making videos is something I definitely underestimated before actually making these. The process is very long and having to work a job in between takes a lot of time up. So please, if you wouldn't mind, all I do is just ask to stay subscribed because there's gonna certainly be more videos to come. All I want out of these videos is just for people to watch and start discussion on these games and hopefully to revitalize some of the multiplayer for this game because I feel like it's died a lot in the past three years. So if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If not, well, let me know what you didn't like down there in the comments and I'll try to improve moving forward. And while you're down in the comments, let me know which out of the trilogy you thought was the best Gears game. I think personally, I still may put the second above the third, but I'm not entirely sure. But with all that being said, thanks to you all so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out. Thank <laughs> you.